Hello, hello. Welcome to my video, Meiosis in Minutes. Um, the, we'll see how many minutes it takes to go through this, but it's a catchy title, don't you think? Meiosis in Minutes. Um, so the goal here is to go over um, the goals and the processes of mitosis and meiosis. Um, and, and then hopefully I'll be able to blow your mind at the end because this is really cool and the implications it has um, for us and our posterity are really, really cool. So we'll show you that at the end. Um, so I'll walk through, I've got a li I'll make a list of the steps over here on the left and then we'll be running through it visually over here on the right. So bear with me, um, but hopefully this will really, really help um, augment your readings a little bit here, make a little more sense. Okay, so the differences between mitosis and meiosis. First off, can we all acknowledge that the scientists who came up with these names are downright jerks? That there's a diff or that they make it a one sound difference between the two words. I mean, really. To be honest though, they've done worse. Believe me, if you keep going in science, it gets worse. So, you know, we could be more brutal. <laughs> okay, there's my rant for the day. <laughs> the goal of mitosis is to create two identical, or sorry, is to take one diploid cell and create two identical diploid cells. That's the goal of mitosis. Um, Mitosis will be done in practically every cell of your entire body. Um, the, if you get a cut, for example, the skin cells have to be able to replace or have to be able to fill in the gap that you just made by cutting and replace the dead ones. Um, and so in order to do that, they go through mitosis to split themselves into two identical copies because I want to make another skin cell to fill in that hole. All of your cells in your body do this. They divide to make an identical copy. And so I want to take one diploid cell and make an identical second diploid cell that looks exactly like mine. And that's the goal of mitosis. Meiosis is slightly different. The goal of meiosis is to take one diploid cell and turn it into four unique haploid cells. Now let's go over that word, that term there. Remember diploid means you have two copies of every chromosome. Haploid means you have one copy of every chromosome. Now when would I ever use this? Um, the, the only place in the entire body where you will use meiosis is in creating the sex cells in the reproductive organs. So ovaries for females, testicles for males, that's the only place you're ever going to use meiosis because um, cells can't last very long time without having two copies of every chromosome. They don't work very well. Um, and so we can only spare to have it in one place. Plus it kind of defeats the purpose to have it anywhere else. You need two copies. So why create cells that only have one? Uh, the reason is for its, its reproductive reasons. Because if we have, if we were to make sex cells like sperm and egg, that had two copies of every chromosome in them, then when the sperm and the egg merge, you will make a baby cell that has four copies of every chromosome. And that's, that's a tetraploidy, um, which is lethal in humans. So our, if we went off of that notion, we would double the amount of chromosomes you had in your cells every generation, which would get out of hand really quick, even if it didn't kill us at round two. So we, the goal of meiosis is to create two, or is to create haploid cells that have half the number of chromosomes you need so that when mom's egg and dad's sperm merge, you wind up with a, with a cell that is diploid again, like it's supposed to be. That's the goal of meiosis. The, now the unique part over here, the reason why we want them to be unique is to generate diversity. Um, this is a, uh, this is an evolution principle where if me and everybody else are exactly the same, 
then let's say one of us is susceptible to a disease and that kills me. If, it'll, if it could kill me and everybody else is exactly like me, it could kill everybody else too, and then we wouldn't have a species anymore. So the idea behind, um, behind making sure we have diversity, making sure that we have genetic variation in each and every offspring is to increase the chances of survival so that if a bad thing happens to one of me, to some of us, then the hope is that at least one of us is resistant and resilient to that particular challenge and so the species can go on. So we want our kids to be different than we are. Um, so that's why we want unique haploid cells out of meiosis, whereas in mitosis I want every cell in my body to belong to me. So that one, I need identical diploid cells so that they can be fully functional and serve me and my body. So we're going to focus on meiosis because meiosis is the more complicated of the two. And if you know meiosis with a little bit of variation, you know mitosis too. So we'll come back to mitosis here in a sec after we go over meiosis. So in meiosis, we start out with a diploid cell and we have to somehow create four unique haploid cells. Well, to create four unique haploid cells, that means you need four copies of every chromosome in total. And over here, we only have two copies of every chromosome to start, which means in order to do that, I need to make, I need to make copies of the DNA um, in this diploid cell over here. So the first step here, now while not technically part of mitosis or meiosis, and this kind of irks me a little bit, um, this is the cell cycle, you don't need to know it, um, but I find it fascinating. The M up here represents when we're going, the amount of time in the cell's life that it goes through mitosis or meiosis, and the rest of these are called interphase, between the three of them they're interphase, um, which means anytime we're not spent in mitosis or meiosis. <laughs> um, and so interphase isn't part of mitosis or meiosis, um, and DNA replication happens out here in the middle of interphase. Oh, sorry. It's 157. Sorry about that. Um, DNA replication happens out here in the middle of interphase. But for the purposes of this class, because the DNA repl even though the DNA replication isn't technically part of mitosis and meiosis, for the purpose of your assignments, think of DNA replication as the first part. Um, I know it drives it may drive you crazy, it kind of drives me crazy too, but for the purpose of our assignments, DNA replication is the first step in mitosis or meiosis. Okay, there's the truth and the lie, and I just told you which one to believe. So there you go. All right, so back to here. So the first step is to duplicate the DNA. The chromosomes. Um, so we're duplicating the chromosomes. Again, that's an interphase, but we'll bear with it. First step is to duplicate the chromosomes, and next week we'll learn how to do that. And it's a very fun nightmare. So good luck with that. Um, hopefully I'll have videos for you next week too. Um, it's actually really fascinating. But for now, we're just going to say we're going to copy it. So we take this and go copy, paste. And we create an identical copy. Now this is where the chromosomes stop looking like I's and start looking like X's. So you'll just have to pretend that mine looks like an X because I can't really create the pinches with my software here. Um, so they're held together at the centromere. Now here's another interesting technicality uh, that's a good vocab thing to know. Um, and it confused me for ages and that's why I'm going to go over it here. Sick here. Okay, here we go. It turns out that the definition of a chromosome on a technical level, um, in order to be a chromosome, it, to figure out how many chromosomes you have, you count how many centromeres you have. Um, and so this stick right here is a chromosome because it has one centromere. And before, before we duplicated here, this one had one centromere, because we learned about that in week one. This one has a centromere. So this is two chromosomes, hence they're diploid. 
right? Well, now when we duplicate the DNA, here's where things start getting a little tricky. Because if I come in here, and I duplicate the DNA, it turns out that these two are held together by the centromere, which means there is only one centromere between the two of them, right there, which means this now is a chromosome. So let me come in here and duplicate the red one too, because the red one also gets duplicated. Okay. There is a, so the red one's also going to have its own centromere here. Um, so now we duplicated the chromosomes and came out with two chromosomes because this is a chromosome and this is a chromosome. Isn't that obnoxious? So I doubled the amount of DNA in my cell and yet have the same number of chromosomes. But because, so because the word chromosome no longer refers to this stick, we had to come up with another word for it. Because once it got doubled, now this whole thing is a chromosome. So this is no longer a chromosome, it's part of a chromosome. So we came up with a new word and each stick is called a chromatid. So two chromatids make a chromosome. Isn't that awful? Okay, so in fact, because these are both identical to each other, because they're photocopies of each other, they're like siblings, like sisters. We call them sister chromatids. When they're sister chromatids, they're identical, and they're bound by a centromere, and two sister chromatids makes up a chromosome. Isn't that awful? Then as soon as we rip these things apart again, they start to become chromosomes again. We're the best. Scientists are awesome. Okay. So now that we've made that distinction, clear that away. All right. So right now, this is still a diploid cell, even though there's four copies of every gene, because there's two centromeres of, for every chromosome type. So it's still diploid. Don't get lost on me there. Okay, so the step, first step there was to duplicate the chromosomes. Now that we've duplicated the chromosomes, we can go into meiosis here. Now meiosis is split up into phases. Um, I have it listed as steps here. The official term is phases, and there are four phases to meiosis. The first one is called prophase. Prophase um, is a phase where it, pro means prepare. And the way that I remember this one, I mean, people remember this in all different kinds of ways. You're welcome to come up with your own. The way that I remember this is professionals always win. If you're competing against a professional, they always win. And so pro comes first. Pros always come first in money, in attention, in everything. Um, so prophase comes first and it's the preparation phase. It turns out that when you duplicate the DNA, it's not actually condensed. Like I'm showing it here, it's uncondensed. And in order to be able to move it around easily in meiosis, we need to condense it. So one of the first things we do here is we have to condense the chromosomes. So we condense them down so that they look like X's like you're used to seeing in the microscope there. So that's the first thing we have to do in prophase is condense the chromosomes. The second thing we have to do is homologous chromosomes, oops, homologous chromosomes pair up with each other. Now, when you do your Plato assignment, um, you're, it's going to show what that means is the two X's approach each other and they get next to each other. That's not exactly what happens. It gets far more, um, far more close up than that. Um, so let me bring you over here and show you. In reality, in three dimensions, what it looks like. So remember, these two sister chromatids are stuck together at a centromere. If I turn this on its side and turn this pair 
on its side. Notice the red one would be homologous to the blue one, but the two blue ones are sisters to each other. Just clarifying that one from week one. Um, they're, they meet up like this. And if I pop this into three dimensions here, I think that's what this button does. There we go. Notice it looks like a bundle of sticks because this back blue one is making out with that back red one, and this front blue one is making out with that front red one. Uh, gets even better because they pass things back and forth, so we'll keep this PG. Um, it is the sex chromosomes, I suppose. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, I'm tired. Okay, here we go. Um, so they pair up like this, but in when you're doing your assignment, you, it's fine to just show them side by side. This is just what it's technically doing. And um, we actually call this setup its own little vocab word here, which I'm not sure you need to know, but you may as well. It's called a tetrad because tetra means four. So it's a group of four. So it's a tetrad. Um, so tetrad is a group of four chromatids or bound together. Um, there's a there's a little sticky piece in the middle here that thankfully you don't need to know the name of it because it's a tongue twister. Um, just know that they're stuck together not by a centromere, but by something else that you don't need to know. Um, okay. So there, so the homologous chromosomes have pa have paired up here. And then the third thing we're doing here is we are um, doing crossing over. So the reason why we need these homologous chromosomes to pair up is so that they can do crossing over. Remember, the goal of meiosis was to create four unique haploid cells. Um, well, the in order to make them unique, because remember the two sister chromatids were identical to each other, in order to make four unique haploid cells, I need to be able to change up what these chromosomes look like. So what we do is crossing over. And what that means is this blue chromatid here gives part of its, or, or basically they swap genes with each other. They say, oh, you've got an eye color gene. Oh, so do I, and they trade. Um, so, so there could be, if I come in here, oh, I need a marker. Sorry guys, I'm all over the place today. Thanks for putting up with me. Okay, here we go. Okay, come in here with blue. So a part of the blue chromosome lands over here on the red one, and the red one in its place gives The red one will give it part of itself as well. And I don't know why it's not working. That's really frustrating. Okay, anyway, they will trade parts. There should be a red line over there. All right, this way. Okay, red line. Doot, 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 doot. All right, so they will trade, um, they trade all along their length. We would have another red line over here and like another blue line over here. So in your assignment, it makes it look like we're swapping like, like a fourth of the chromosome over in one big chunk. In reality, we're just swapping individual genes all along the length, but it's simpler to show like a quarter of the chromosome being grouped. Shows the same idea, um, but in reality, we're just transferring genes. Okay, um, so pretend those lines are there. Again, I don't know why my program is not working anymore. Um, all right, so there's that. So we've done crossing over, so we'll have four unique chromatids. Okay, that's all prophase. Now what we're going to do is the next step is called metaphase. And in metaphase, um, what happens is these little strings um, called spindle fibers come out from the side of the cell 
These little strings called spindle fibers come out from the side of the cell, um, either side of the cell, and connect to the center or the centromeres of the two chromosomes that we have here, um, and basically start playing tug of war with them. Um, we're we're trying each side of the cell is trying to drag the chromosomes to its side of the cell, um, and so you're it goes that this way and that. And since they're both pulling about equally, we wind up dragging them to about the middle of the cell. So all of the chromosomes, remember this is just one chromosome pair, but all 23 pairs are doing this. All 23 pairs get tug of ward until they're all lined up right here on the middle of the cell. Um, that's metaphase. And the way that I remember that is meta and middle stand with, or start with the same letter. So metaphase, um, the homologous chromosomes line up along the middle of the cell. Okay. Well, just chromosomes line up along the middle of the cell. That's what happens during metaphase. And we'll come back to metaphase later because um, there's an important part of creating genetic diversity that's involved in metaphase as well. So we'll come back to that later. But that's essentially all that happens in metaphase. Its whole job is to get these chromosomes to line up in the middle of the cell. Um, come in here and get rid of these lines here. We kn know that they're there. They still, they're still there. But we'll just simplify this here. Okay, the next phase is called anaphase. And in anaphase, the tug of war game gets a little, uh, gets a little dicey. And the, the little glue that was holding the two chromosomes together that I didn't name because it was a tongue twister rips. And so because it rips, that means these, the ropes that were pulling the red ones towards the right yank it this way. And the ropes that were pulling the blue ones to the left yank it this way. And so we wind up with the homologous chromosomes separating and going to opposite sides of the cell. So that's what we're doing here. Homologous chromosomes separate to opposite sides of the cell. That's what we're doing here in anaphase is homologous chromosomes separate to opposite sides of the cell. The way I've heard several ways of remembering this and all of them are fantastic. Um, anaphase starts with the same letter as apart or away or um, the letter A looks like it's splitting. If you go top to bottom, it looks like it's splitting. Um, those are ways that I remembered it. You're welcome to come up with your own. Um, but that's what happens during anaphase is the homologous chroma chromosomes are pulled apart and separated to opposite sides of the cell. Now in this last phase here, in this last phase, it's called telophase or telophase, depending on what part of the country you're from. Um, in telophase, it's basically, we're trying to undo prophase with the exception of crossing over. Um, so we already ripped the homologous chromosomes apart. We're not doing crossing over again, um, or we're not undoing crossing over, I mean, um, but we're gonna uncondense the chromosomes. And there are other things that happened in prophase, like we dissolved the nucleus and stuff that you don't need to know about. Basically the whole goal is to undo prophase. So we uncondense chromosomes and the most important part for the purposes of this class is we divide the cell in two. So, um, so telophase starts with the same letter as two. We take, it comes in here and it's actually really cool if you get to if you get to see it, um, it comes in here and we build a brand new cell membrane that just completely separates the two cells. Now these are two completely independent, unique cells. They don't are independent cells. They don't talk to each other anymore. Everything we do from here on out, they're completely separate and independent cells. So now what I've got is a cell over, or is a chromatid or a chromosome over here. 
and the chromosome over here. Okay, there we go. Oh, and the markings did work. Ta da! Who knew? All right, so now we've got these two. Um, now, notice these are haploid cells because, again, we only have one centromere in each. Um, of each of each pair, I mean. But now, so we finished the whole round of meiosis. But now let's look, have we accomplished our goal? The goal of meiosis was to get four unique haploid cells. I have two unique haploid cells, but what's worse is I've got, yes, they're haploid, but I still have four, I still have two copies of every gene in each of these cells, and I need one copy of every gene in each cell. So we're not done yet. Um, what I need to do is half these again. So we go through the entire process all over again. We start back at prophase. Yeah. We start right back at prophase again. And we recondense the chromosomes that we just, um, that we just uncondensed in telophase. I know it seems extremely inconvenient. So we recondense the chromosomes. Um, and we don't do crossing over a second time. Now notice we also didn't duplicate the chromosomes a second time. That seems to confuse a lot of people, but if you think about it, if I duplicated the chromosomes a second time, I'd be back up to four copies of every gene in each cell. That's right where I started. We'd make no progress that way. So we don't duplicate the DNA again, and we don't do crossing over again either. So, but other than that, other than those two exceptions, um, and the fact that we can't pair up homologous chromosomes and sister chromatids are already paired up, we've done prophase again. So really all we're doing is recondensing the chromosomes. Then we do metaphase again. And metaphase, we line up in the middle, but this time instead of lining homologous chromosomes up across the middle, we're lining sister chromatids up across the middle sister chromatids line up across the middle of the cell. So again, those spindle fibers in each of these two cells, remember they're still independent, come in here and tug of war, but this time we're, we're tug of warring them this way. We're splitting sister chromatids. So before we had that tetrad, we're, we split it this way, now we're this way and we're gonna split them this way. Um, so that that pair of sister chromatids gets dragged to the middle and this pair of sister chromatids gets dragged to the middle. And then we're gonna do anaphase. And in anaphase, we're going to split the sister chromatids from each other. So sister chromatids separate to opposite sides of the cell. Um, so we're going to take this one and drag it over here. Oh, hi. And we're going to take this one and we're going to drag it over here. And we'll take this one and we'll drag it over here. We'll take this one and we'll drag it over here. Remember, each of these cells are still independent. So it's going to be dragged to the opposite sides of their respective cell. And then we, so in that case, we ripped the centromere apart. So now each of these has a centromere, so very, very temporarily, we're back to being diploid, isn't that crazy? But we don't really think about it because it's very, very temporary. Um, and then, um, and then telophase, we do telophase again, we uncondense the chromosomes, and we draw new lines in between the cells here, there and there. Now, we've made four cells that each have one copy of every chromosome, which makes them haploid, and one copy of every gene, which again makes them haploid, um, which means we're done. We accomplished our goal. Now also notice the unique, because these back ones, I didn't really get a chance to draw lines on them, but they're randomly swapped genes, and these front ones randomly swapped genes, and so notice all four of them are completely different. Um, so I just created four unique haploid cells. Now, if you're a male, each of these becomes a sperm. If you're a female, um, they're eggs, though only one of them survives. And if you want to read 
why females only ovulate one egg per semester or per period, um, go. Um, I have an article on my website. You can read about that. It's really fascinating. Uh, but yeah, these are the gametes, um, which is what we call them. They're the sex cells. Um, those are gametes. So notice all four of them are unique. Um, and so, so because we had to do meiosis twice, you'll notice there will be some vocab words um, that this will hopefully help clear it up with you. If we're talking, because the two prophases are slightly different from each other, we want to be able to refer to which prophase we're talking about. So the first time we went through prophase is called prophase one. The first time we go through metaphase is metaphase one. The first time we go through anaphase is anaphase one. And the first time we go through telophase is, or telophase, sorry, is telophase one. And then the second time we go through prophase is prophase two, then metaphase two, anaphase two, and telophase two. And together, prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, and telophase one together make up meiosis one. And prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, and telophase two together make up meiosis two because this was the first round of meiosis and this was the second round of meiosis. So that's, um, that's that. So you duplicate the chromosomes and then you go through a round of meiosis and then another round of meiosis and you wind up with four haploid cells. The only differences between how this process works and the process of mitosis is we don't do crossing over and we only go through the round once. Um, and of course, homologous chromosomes don't pair up. So no crossing over, no homologous chromosomes, and we only go through it once. So basically, um, it's, mitosis is the equivalent of duplicating the chromosomes and then doing meiosis two. So you basically skip meiosis one and do meiosis two, and each of the, um, each of the um, homologous chromosomes behaves like its own chromosome. Um, and so then all, um, all 46 duplicated chromosomes line up along the middle and get separated to opposite sides of the cell in that case. And so you wind up with one copy of all 46 chromosomes landing in each cell. Those are the only differences. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that. Um, that's mitosis and meiosis um, in a few minutes there. Um, so here's the other thing just to show you because I find this fascinating and it's good, it's good to know. Um, so if we come down here, there, remember how earlier we talked about how we need, um, we need diversity in our, in our descendants in order to make them um, unique so that our species doesn't get wiped out. Um, not to mention social constraints. <laughs> um, so there are three ways that have been created by nature to help generate diversity um, in creating the children. The first one is crossing over because crossing over allowed us to create completely unique chromosomes that are completely different um, from any that the parents had because they're combinate each chromosome is a combination of both parents uh, or of both the grandparents I mean but um, so you took both of your your chromosomes and you scrambled them up to make two chromosomes that aren't yours um, so much so that actually um, fun fact for you the male testicles have to be kept very very separate from the bloodstream because the immune cells of the bloodstream, if they found the sperm, would kill them as hostile invaders because they don't recognize them as yours. They're that different, which is fun, fun fact for you. So the first thing we do is crossing over and that is um, homologous chromosomes. Chromosomes. Uh, trade genes. So there's that one. That's the first one. The second one 
And the second method of generating diversity is random alignment. I'm sure I spelled that wrong, but that's okay. Random alignment. <laughs> and what random alignment is, is that part during metaphase that I told you about, specifically metaphase one. Um, it turns out that, and let me, let me bring this over here again. Oops. There we go. I love, I love Zoom, but man, sometimes it gets in the way. Okay, here we go. So if we go undo over here. Okay, now we've got these paired up. Let's create a second pair down here at the bottom. Um, because remember, all 23 sets of chromosomes are going through this process at the same time. Um, so let's create another pair just to help show you this. So this other pair will have a black one and maybe a, uh, I don't know, a dark or a gray one. We've got a black one and a gray one. So these are, have also gone through crossing over. So don't forget that. And they're duplicated in one another. This is just to help show a point. Um, so we do metaphase, we're lining up along the middle, but it, if you have, but it's completely random which side each chromosome lands on. Let me show you what I mean. If we did anaphase right here, then the blue ones and the black ones would get carried to the left cell, and the red ones and the white ones would get carried to the right cell, right? Um, they, um, so the, the blue and the black would get separate. So now I just created a gamete with blue and black and a gamete with red and white. But what if during the process of everyone lining up, I actually had the black one land on the right and the white one land on the left. Now, in this case, when I split the cells, I wind up with a red and black gamete and a blue and white gamete over here in this cell. So now they're completely different. So even with just two sets of chromosomes involved here, I could create four different, um, four different gametes just doing that. Now, if you step it up to meiosis one and then you do it again in meiosis two, um, you know, you're really, we're really scrambling things up. And then you have to keep in mind that we're doing this with 23 different pairs. And I'll show you, this is really mind blowing. I'll show you the math here in a little bit because it's really, really cool, at least in my opinion. Um, it's crossing over, random alignment. That was the second one. So chromosomes, okay, here we go. Chromosomes um, are, yeah, chromosomes randomly sides in metaphase. Now, one, one way that I like to think about this, because we're Americans, um, and we love our football game, um, the idea behind football, you know how a game starts, you've got like your 50 yard line right here in the middle, um, and then you've got a bunch of these big, huge, beefy guys, um, you've got like the red team down the left side here, right? You've got all of these big, huge, beefy linebackers that are lining up to try and kill each other. Then you've got the, we'll have a green team down the right. I served my mission in Wisconsin, so you know we have to represent. Um, we've got a green team down the right here. Okay, um, so they line up along the midline. Well, let's say we've got this scenario where we've just got play, it's before the game, we've got players just randomly walking all over the field. You know, there are red guys walking over here and over here and green guys walking around. They're just mingling or whatnot. And then the whistle blows and everyone's like, free. We need to get to the midline. So everyone races to the midline. Well, if they race to their closest side, then rather than having all the red on one side and all the green on this side, I could potentially have 
a couple of red guys on this side and a couple of red guys over here and a couple of green guys over here and a couple of green guys over here. So now notice I just created a different possible set of lines because I still have every red guy is facing a green guy, but they're not necessarily on the same side of the line. And then you could do a different arrangement where this top red guy winds up on the right and the top green guy winds up on the left. So even with just using these few, this few number of linebackers, you could create a near infinite possible, possible number of front lines there based on who's on which side randomly. That's what we're doing in random alignment is we're taking the 23 chromosomes and randomly deciding which, which copy of the chromosome lands on which side. And you can create a ton of different possible teams that way. Um, so there's your little analogy to help you. Okay, the third one, let me switch back to blue here. The third one actually happens after meiosis. So these first two happen in meiosis. This last one happens after meiosis. This one is called random fertilization. Okay, random fertilization. What this is, is as we learn from meiosis, every time a man goes through meiosis and a woman goes through meiosis, we create four unique, um, four unique gametes. So if we've got a man that creates four unique sperm, and a woman that creates four unique eggs but only releases one, um, now, the, if this one here, if this sperm here is the first one, basically the way fertilization works is it's a mad rush of like thousands of sperm attacking the egg at once and whoever gets in first wins. Um, and so this sperm, let's say he randomly is the one that manages to get into the egg first. Then whatever chromosome he has is, or whatever set of chromosomes he has is going to be the one that pairs up with this egg's random set. But what if this guy gets in first? Then we'd have a different result. Or what if this guy gets in first? Then we'd have a different result, et cetera. So depending on which sperm hits the egg first, um, you could create a near infinite number of kids even off of just one egg and whichever sperm happens to hit. Now let me show you just how random this can make it because um, if you use a little bit of math here, you can create or you can figure out just how incredible it is that you are the person that you are. So let me let me clear my drawings here. Well actually let me just erase back here. So we'll ju I'll just reduce it back to this left side here because the math is fascinating for me. Okay, let's bring this up over here. That's really trippy. Let's not have it there. Sorry guys, this has not been my technology day. Okay, here we go. So if you go through random, I brought this up for calculator's sake because <laughs> this will be very nice. So for crossing over, Um, we have, it turns out that the human, that the human genome has approximately 23,000 genes in it. Um, so you've got 23,000 genes, and since you've got two copies of each gene that could land on, or you've got two copies of each gene, and they could land on either side, right? Because we're doing a random switch. Some of the genes won't switch sides, and some of the genes will, and that's completely randomized. And so there are, so each of the 23,000 genes has two possible positions to be in. Um, so the, so to do it, you've got two, um, two possible areas, um, or two possible positions for each gene and approximately 23,000 genes. Well, in order to calculate how many possible combinations you could get out of just crossing over, 
the math formula is two to the power of however many genes there are, which in this case would be 23,000, which comes out to a really big number. Now let me merge this over here. Even then, it's too big. <laughs> That's a really big number. <laughs> Two to the power of 23,000 is a really big number, so much so that even Excel is making me look like an idiot and not showing up. And I apologize for that. It's a really big number. Um, in fact, I think we used the calculator before. Ah, yeah, here we go. Um, two to the power 23,000. So notice that's times 10 to the 6,923. So basically picture it's four with 6,900 zeros afterward. That's that many possible gametes you, cre you could create just using crossing over. And then, um, so that's like, yeah, so over here, we write that in. So we'll just write it here. We'll do it ourselves. So that's approximately four times 10 to the, uh, oops, 10 to the um, 6,000. That's a really, 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 really big number. Um, and that's how many possible gametes you could create using just crossing over alone. Now, if you go, now let's look at random alignment. That's how you spell alignment. Um, random alignment, we've got 23 chromosomes on or we've got 23 different kinds of chromosomes that could each land on opposite sides or could each land in one of the two positions on the side of the midline. So again, we've got two possible positions and 23 possible or and 23 pairs. So that would be two to the power of 23. So two to the power of 23. You could possibly, using just random alignment, a human cell could create 8 million 388,608,388,608. But remember, we do random alignment twice. Once in meiosis one, once in meiosis two. So it would actually be that doubled. Or it would, it would be that squared actually. So equals that a really big number. Then if we look at random fertilization, I'm not even going to do the math on that one because really what you would have to do is take the odds of finding each gamete. So you would have to do this big number times that big number to find out the odds of making any specific sperm for the man. But remember the woman's doing the same thing. So mom so to figure out the odds of, of creating a specific egg, you'd have to take mom's four times 10 to the 6,900 times this gigantic number. And so you'd get mom's and dad's, and then you'd multiply those two together. And basically what you come up with is infinity. So one couple could create a near infinite number of children and have them all be completely unique. Crazy, huh? makes you think God has a near infinite number of children and yet we're all different. Food for thought, food for thought. Anyway, thank you for watching this video. I hope it wasn't too overwhelming. Um, please feel free to email me or, um, or text me if you have any questions um, or set up a tutoring appointment through iPlan. Um, I'm happy to help with anything that you're still confused with, and hopefully these resources are helping. Um, have a wonderful day.